So let me uh, uh, introduce Jim before we put his uh, uh, visuals up. Uh, it's, our speaker is actually Brian Martin, if you read the, the title on his book, so we know him as Chip. Uh, Chip's a, a prolific author, uh, having published just, just shy of a dozen books, uh, at least six on baseball subjects during the past eight years. A retired journalist, uh, Chip graduated from uh, Western uh, University in London, Ontario, with a degree in journalism and was a long-term reporter and columnist for the London Free Press. He covered a host of, of beats from, uh, uh, including uh, uh, general reporting and, and, and columns and, and uh, investigations. But he's also done uh, books in addition to baseball on uh, uh, a crime, biography, true crime and biography and that sort of thing. In 1913, he started uh, uh, publishing baseball uh, books. He's done books on Pud Galvin, the Tecumsehs of the International Association, Baseball's Creation Myth, myth and a volume that's due out uh, uh, this year on Barney Dreyfus. Uh, Chip is also the founder and director of the uh, Center for Canadian Baseball Research and holds a position on the selection committee for, for Canada's Baseball Hall of Fame. Tonight's topic is uh, kidnapping their way to baseball glory, the story of the Detroit Wolverines, obviously in the 19th century. So Chip, if you will uh, uh, hit screen share and bring your slides up, we'll get started. Okay, you're my coach, so. Uh, um, go to the bottom and hit the green button where it says screen share at the bottom. Oh, there we are, gotcha. Thank you, coach. Put me in, coach. Your now, center field and, and up. In your dialogue box, your slideshow should show up. Um, there's a button that says share. I hit that. Yeah. Okay. But you what? Yeah. There you go. And then in the in there should you have a choice of things to put on? Oh boy. Oh boy. Here I'm screen sharing. Okay. So, um, Coach, I need to help again. All right. Got to close your screen share. Just. Turn it off. So we'll start okay. over. So I'm going to turn that off. Okay. Move. Stop. Share. There we are. Gotcha. There you go. Now, now this was my nightmare. The technical stuff. Okay. Now hit it again and and share screen. You should get a dialog box that has a number of things, including your slideshow in it, to select. So I click on the slideshow. Yes. Okay. That's what I didn't do. There we are. And there you are. Now, if you just make it full screen, you're off and running. Um, down there's here, a, yes. There's a button over on the left corner of your screen. As a little square. It's a third one in on the left corner. Down here? Yeah, there you are. There you are. Hit it. Click okay. that. I'm seeing. There you go. Yeah. Here you come. There we are. There you go. And you're off and running. Go, take it away, Chip. Okay. Well, nice to see all these familiar faces tonight. Uh, and thank you for having me. I'm, I'm quite honored and I'm also intimidated uh, with all the baseball knowledge uh, that's present tonight. There we go. Okay, this is my opening slide and uh, Detroit, by the 1880s was a bustling and attractive city, sometimes referred to as the Paris of the West, believe it or not. By then, the population was surpassing 100,000, and it was a popular destination for tourists who would come by ship to admire its well-laid-out streets and find architecture. Because of its location and its large hinterland of raw materials, Detroit was becoming a manufacturing center. Major industries were paints and solvents, pharmaceuticals, cooking stoves, rail cars, and steel wheels. Also known as the city of the Straits, Detroit was a leafy and pleasant community controlled by old families and new capitalists, years away from the transformation that would be wrought by the automobile. Henry Ford was a young man still tinkering with his inventions, not far away at the family farm in Dearborn. The image you see here is the Russell House Hotel. Some of the earliest baseball games in the city were played by amateurs on a vacant lot next to the Russell House Hotel downtown. So many errant baseballs from morning practices and games smashed through its glass windows 
that the hotel eventually established a flat fee for replacing them. The hotel later became headquarters for the gentleman who decided to bring professional baseball to Detroit. One of the early homegrown amateur teams was called the Early Risers, so named because they played and practiced before reporting for work in the morning. In this view of downtown Detroit can be seen City Hall, Michigan Avenue running off to the left and Woodward Avenue slightly to the right. This is a view from Campus Martius, which featured the Soldiers and Sailors Monument erected in 1867 to honor those who died in the Civil War. This is a map of Detroit from about 1880 on which I have marked Recreation Park to the north. Superimposed on the map are the later locations of Tiger Stadium at Michigan and Trumbull Avenues to the left and today's Comerica Park, just south of Recreation Park along Brush Avenue. Another park to the east near the bridge to Belle Isle, just off the map to the right, was used before Michigan and Trumbull was settled upon. Several blocks north of downtown was Harper Hospital, behind which a recreational facility would be created on land that had been part of the Brush family farm. Some of Detroit's leading businessmen latched onto the idea of establishing a harness racing and recreational park. Sorry, this is a little fuzzy. It was a business investment for them and it provided a diversion for Detroiters who were just beginning to get some spare time away from the factory floor to enjoy some outdoor activities. In 1879, Recreation Park was opened, a facility that included a three quarter mile racetrack, a baseball diamond, a cricket pitch, skating rink and gymnasium. There's a bit of a better outline of it. <clears throat> the entrance is to the right uh, and north is to the left. Um, but this gives you an idea of what was there. And like other uh, early ballparks, it was a, 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 a horse racing facility because you could control entrance and make money. Bill Hollinger, a billiard enthusiast turned baseball manager, came to Detroit looking to recruit talent for his professional Cleveland team for the 1879 season. But while he was in Detroit, his baseball business partner back home abandoned him. So Hollinger decided to form Detroit's first professional nine. This coincided with the opening of Recreation Park, almost exactly, whose backers were looking for attractions to lure the paying public. A professional ball team was a perfect fit, they reasoned, and the Hollinger Nine had a ballpark, a home ballpark. Recreation Park featured a fine entrance building and clubhouse, along with a boardroom, change rooms, restaurant, smoking room, and ticket office. The park occupied 18 acres in all. You may note the sign in the foreground indicating the half mile point on the three quarter mile harness racing track. I believe this historical marker, or I believe the historical marker that today marks Recreation Park is located very near where this sign once stood. I quite like this photograph. Another shot of the entrance to Recreation Park, which, would, which was bulldozed in 1894 to make way for housing. So it was only around for a few years. By then professional baseball had moved to a park near Belle Isle and then west to the famous corner of Michigan and Trumbull. The Hollinger Nine of 1879 was an independent team and relied on games with barnstorming professional clubs for revenue. The club also visited various cities and towns across Michigan, but was unable to arrange enough games to cover its costs and it disbanded before the 1879 season ended. William G. Thompson, he was a lawyer and decided it was time to get Detroit, Detroit into, the big league, into the big league baseball. He was extremely well connected with the city's elite and was elected city mayor in late 1879. Sorry about the writing on this. It's very hard to decipher, but I, it's there because of, the, uh, of the, the top of the letters. On November 14, 1880, Thompson and some business associates applied for a National League franchise on letterhead of the mayor's office. Thompson signed as president of the baseball, Detroit Baseball Club. 
Thompson was mayor from 1880 until the end of 1883, and he ran the team, which became known as the Wolverines from his office at City Hall. The Wolverine name was widely used in Michigan at the time, but in the tradition of the day, most often the ball club was simply known, known as the Detroits. Today, the name Wolverine is almost exclusively associated with athletic teams of the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. This is an actual Wolverine, a carnivore known for its ferocity and tenacity. It is not native to Michigan, and the first one was found in the wilds of the state in 2004. Despite this, Michigan has been known as the Wolverine State for many, many years. How can this be, I wondered. The Wolverine name had its origins in a nasty dispute between, between Michigan and Ohio about a thin bit of territory known as the Toledo Strip. Yes, the city of Toledo was in it, although it was a town in 1835 and 1836, when each state armed its militia to assert its claims to the territory. Michigan territory precipitated the dispute when it applied for statehood in 1835 and claimed the strip as its own. The only time shots were fired was into the air, supposedly, during this conflict. The protagonists preferred to hurl insults across the disputed land. For some reason, the Ohio militia began calling Michigan men wolverines, likely as an insult because the animal was viewed as obnoxious. The Michiganders decided they liked the name and it became associated with the state appearing on the names of businesses as well as sports teams. The border dispute was eventually settled in 1836 when Congress came up with a compromise that granted the strip to Ohio, but assigned Michigan about three quarters of what is now the Upper Peninsula. At the time, some Michiganders were incensed, but grew to like the acquisition over time because the UP, as it's called, was rich in mineral resources and lumber. Sort of like uh, Seward, all the criticism he got for buying Alaska, and then in the fullness of time, we realized it was, a, it was a pretty good deal. Well, Michigan came out the winner on this one, as far as I can see. Frank Bancroft, who had managed the International Association uh, and, in, and National League teams in Worcester, Massachusetts, was hired as Detroit's first manager. He remained for two years, when the Wolverines finished fourth and then slipped to sixth. By the way, anybody here from Massachusetts that I get Worcester pronounced correctly? I hope I did, okay. When the Wolverines finished fourth and then slipped to sixth, Bancroft was one of the first managers to conduct spring training in the South. Pennsylvania native Charlie Bennett was an outstanding catcher who joined the Wolverines for their first season and stayed until the last. Handsome and highly skilled, Bennett quickly became a crowd favorite. He's considered one of the best catchers of his day, and I think one of these days he'll be uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame, but that's just me. Ned Hanlon, also joining the Wolverines for the inaugural 1881 season and remaining until the last was Ned Hanlon, a talented center fielder from the Cleveland Blues. He was known for his speed and base stealing, and by 1882, Hanlon was captain of the team. In 1883, Detroit finished seventh in the eight-team National League. During 1884, however, the Wolverines dropped to dead last, prompting fears the team might disband. Founding president William Thompson was bitterly disappointed, especially with the behavior and, and integrity of players, and he left the club. This is... Uh, Kerry, recognize this? <laughs> if you look at Kerry Smith, this is what he had behind him. <clears throat> this is a fine image of a game <clears throat> at Recreation Park played in the 1880s. The Garland sign promoted the company's stoves, while to the left can be seen an ad for the Hudson's Department Store, which had just opened its doors in 1881 and later became a city institution. That was looking to the north uh, east. Wolverines president Thompson grew tired of running an unsuccessful baseball club and was replaced by young pharmaceutical manufacturer, Frederick K. Stearns in 1885. 
Stearns' father had founded the second largest pharmaceutical firm in Detroit, and his son was absolutely passionate about baseball. Fred Stearns, at the lower left, played second base on the University of Michigan baseball team, and during the summer, he and other member, uh, members of the team would join the amateur Detroit Etnas. When Fred Stearns took over the reins of the Wolverines, he was determined to produce a winning club for his city. In many ways, he was like George Steinbrenner of the Yankees, determined to find the best players and put a winning nine on the field of Recreation Park. This is him in later life. Stearns was faced with a rare opportunity in June of 1885 when William Watkins, manager and owner of the Indianapolis, Indianapolis Hoosiers, came to Detroit looking to buy the struggling Wolverines. Indianapolis played in the Western League and both Watkins Club and the league itself were about to collapse. Watkins figured by buying the Wolverines, his Hoosiers could thereby gain entry to the National League. But Detroit directors were not interested in selling to him and turned the tables on Watkins. They purchased, they purchased his Indianapolis club for $5,000 in a deal that included star slugger Sam Thompson. The knowledgeable Watkins, whom Stearns immediately liked, was named as Wolverine's manager. Detroit faced unexpected logistical problems by purchasing an entire franchise. This, hadn't, this, sort, of, this sort of transaction hadn't happened before, and the league had no provision for it. League rules said players could not be signed by a new club until 10 days after their release by their old team. But Detroit owned both clubs. It should be no problem, right? Well, this was uncharted territory, and it soon became apparent that managers from other professional teams were vigorously pursuing many of Watkins' Hoosiers despite the 10-day rule. So Stearns, the Detroit directors, and their new manager Watkins devised a scheme to make their acquisitions disappear. The Detroit Free Press explained what happened to the players this way. Quote, it was deemed best to remove them from all outside influence and the entire team came to this city yesterday morning with the Detroit directors. From Detroit, they proceeded by rail to Toronto where they will take a steamer for a pleasure trip down the St. Lawrence to the Thousand Islands. They will join the Detroit club here the middle of next week, end quote. Well, several other versions of the cruise story appeared over the years. One of the Hoosiers, Deacon McGuire, said the players were sent by train to Cleveland, where they boarded a steamer to cruise Lake Erie. The captain, McGuire recalled, was ordered to stay out of sight and deliver his human cargo to Detroit once the 10-day waiting period ended. In his own reminiscences published later, Wolverine's director Stearns said he and his new manager hired a yacht and sent the players on a cruise around Lake Michigan. Stearns candidly described the plight of his human cargo this way, quote, some of them were far from being good sailors and were seasick most of the time. However, we kept them practically prisoners until the time limit had expired when we brought them back to Detroit where they all signed their contracts, close quote. Slugger Sam Thompson, another of the players held hostage, Recalled the captives were entertained royally with food and drink. However, by the sixth day afloat, they were uneasy and demanded to be put ashore, but the captain refused. The hostages realized they couldn't take over the ship because many were just farm boys unfamiliar with sailing, unless it was across a farm pond. Besides, they were out of sight of land and had no idea where they were. As Thompson told the Washington Post years later, we didn't touch land during the time and no boat was allowed to come near us. We were prisoners, but well cared for prisoners. Anything in the line of creature comforts you could find packed away on ice. We lived on the best in the market and spent the rest of the time in fishing and playing poker, chips having very thoughtfully been provided. Safely back in Detroit, Watkins signed them all to contracts. Soon after, the players discovered scores of letters and telegraphs from, telegrams from, with offers from other clubs had piled up for them during their cruise. Cruise. They also quickly discovered that the sea legs they'd acquired made their first few practices far more interesting than they could have expected. Once the new Wolverines were safely signed, the Detroit Free Press reported they had spent their time fishing in the flats, a low-lying um, delta paradise for fishermen and hunters at the north end of Lake St. Clair. 
The original Free Press story about the cruise in the Thousand Islands may have been a ruse to help throw rival teams off the trail of the prized players. The true story is hard to pin down, however. Lake St. Clair, it should be noted, is too small to be out of sight of land for very long, unlike the Great Lakes mentioned by Stearns and the players. And I have sailed <clears throat> all these waterways that I've mentioned, and I should point out that even little Lake St. Clair, which is between Lake Huron and Lake Erie, I've crossed a, across here coming south down to the Bass Islands in Ohio. And when you're out in the middle of the lake, you cannot see the shore on either side. Uh, if you're at a uh, water level, the horizon is at 10 miles because of the curvature of the earth and this is about 30 or 40 miles across so it is possible if you sort of stayed in the middle of the lake and did big lazy circles you could spend a lot of time outside the site of land so I know from personal experience that that lake was a possible contender for where the, the mystery crews took them. Regardless of the actual body of water if team management tried such a tactic today they would face charges of kidnapping, abduction, and likely a slew of other criminal counts. Watkins played a key role in the escapade as team manager. It was in his best interest as owner of the Hoosiers to ensure the deal was consummated with Detroit so as to maximize his own financial return. Fred Stearns was determined to turn around the fortunes of the team and expected much of his new manager. Watkins quickly set to work in his new role, trying to improve the Wolverines during what was left of the 1885 season. Before the year was out, however, there was more risky business to be undertaken by Detroit, another disappearing act by players. Stearns and his fellow Detroit directors learned the Buffalo Bisons were in poor financial conditions and might soon drop out of the National League. Stearns began to pursue Buffalo's big four hitters of Dan Bruthers, Jack Rowe, Hardy Richardson, and Deacon White. Buffalo refused to sell its stars individually and wanted to unload the entire franchise and all players at the same time. After protracted negotiations, Detroit agreed to acquire the Bisons for a reported $7,000. For the second time that year, Detroit directors owned two teams. The Big Four first appeared for the Wolverines in Detroit September 19th for a game at Recreation Park against the New York Giants. But they were barred from playing under the new Saratoga Agreement, which stipulated that no players could be signed until October 20th. So rather than forfeit the game, Detroit made, made the players sit out. Then on the night of September 21st, the four players suddenly disappeared. Detroit and Watkins were up to their old tricks again. The big four wanted to become Wolverines and to avoid other clubs who were pursuing them. The players were soon enjoying themselves, hunting and fishing in the St. Clair Flats, the same marshy area up in there, same marshy area in the north end of Lake St. Clair, about 30 miles north of Detroit which was supposedly one of the hideouts for the Hoosiers back in June. It is believed the Bruthers, Rowe, Richardson and White stayed at the private lodge of one of Detroit's wealthy directors until October 20th. No one found them. And it wasn't until its annual meeting in November that the National League finally ruled that Detroit could keep the big four. Watkins further strengthened the Wolverines in 1886 by acquiring St. Louis second baseman, Fred Dunlap. The team now had a powerhouse roster of strong hitters combined with solid pitching. All was not well, however. Watkins favored strict discipline and he fined his players for poor play and the players were beginning to rebel. The 1886 Wolverines club was a much stronger nine with the addition of slugger Sam Thompson and the bats of the big four. After giving powerful Chicago a run for the money that year, Detroit had to settle for second place in the league two and a half games back of the White Stockings. A large crowd packed Recreation Park to overflowing for a summer game in 1886, likely against Chicago, which traditionally drew the greatest number of fans to the park. Now, this is kind of cool and it's, it's happened elsewhere. Note the cheap seats on the roofs of neighboring buildings. Um, um, Detroit directors went to court to stop the practice, but judges sided with the entrepreneurial neighbors. So the ball club began erecting tarps and signs to block the view prompting the rooftop stands to rise ever higher. And we'll see some, you can't really see the tarps there too much right now, but I, you'll see some in a later picture. Excellent.
Expectations were high for 1887, despite a new gate sharing formula imposed by the league that targeted Detroit for its free spending ways to attract so much top talent. Stearns had bypassed a league imposed cap on players salaries by using personal service contracts at a time when the league was trying to limit player pay in a bid to pursue elusive profits. His payroll was 50% higher than any other team. He was spending money to win. Detroit with its highly paid stars had always drawn better on the road than at home, but that source of gate sharing revenue was sharply curtailed with the new formula. This is a, I'm not exactly sure what this is. It seems to be a sort of a featuring a dollar bill featuring Wolverine's manager, Bill Watkins. It may have had some value at the store indicated in Detroit, which seems to be touting itself as a member of the, the team for 1887. Perhaps it was just a form of advertising to promote the store and the ball club. I, I kind of like, I would like to get a, a Watkins dollar like that. Detroit won the National League pennant 1887, winning 79 games to finish three and a half games ahead of the Phillies. The St. Louis Browns won 95 games in 1887 to handily take the pennant of the American Association, 14 games ahead of Cincinnati. The star of the Browns was left fielder Tip O'Neill, Canadian, who had failed to make the roster of the Wolverines back in 1881 when he tried for a spot as pitcher. He was no longer pitching, but his hit hitting was otherworldly. In 1887, he had a batting average of 435, 14 home runs, 225 hits, 357 total bases, 167 runs, 123 runs batted in, and a slugging average of 691. He led most offensive categories in the American Association. The 1887 season would be a memorable one. Detroit had a terrific roster and it was predicted early on that Wolverines would be the class of the league. Detroit captured first place on May 4th and never relinquished it. Heavy hitting and strong pitching had made Detroit a popular team on the road, not so much at home for reasons that are unclear. Home crowds continued to be light and club finances began to falter just as the club was beginning to do so well on the field. Owners Chris Fondra of St. Louis and Stearns of Detroit came up with a plan for a world championship series to milk every cent out of postseason play. They came up with a scheme to play a 15 game series in a number of cities, 15 games, with all games to be played regardless of the outcome of the previous 14. In the world series, against St. Louis, Tip O'Neill's bat let him down, recording a batting average of 200. Detroit had won the series after 11 games, but the series continued for the full 15 as arranged as crowds became thin in the cold weather. The 15th game was played in St. Louis before 659 shivering fans and the Browns won it nine to two. In taking the World Series championship, the Wolverines denied St. Louis a second consecutive series win. Aside from O'Neill's poor batting, the legendary St. Louis base stealing uh, 581 bases stolen during season play was shut down by the strong arm of Detroit star catcher, Charlie Bennett. At the outset of the 1888 campaign on a cold and gusty day, pennants for the National League and World Series champions were run up the flagpole at Recreation Park. For 1888, the roster was left intact. By now, by now, but excuse me, but by now, most of the Wolverines and players wanted to see Watkins sacked because of his strict discipline and no nonsense approach. They were adamant and refused to play for him. But facing unemployment, they finally relented because the club directors backed Watkins, the manager. The season was dreadful as injuries and bad attitudes afflicted the team while losses piled up. At one point, Watkins fined pitcher Pretzels Getzine a hefty $100 for what he termed back talk. This photo of the team was taken in June in Boston. It appears the images of Dan Bruthers and Lady Baldwin were added later. Home crowds were going even smaller and club directors were concerned about the future. In late August, Watkins could take the heat of criticism no longer and resigned. For Detroit, things didn't improve. 
After the 1888 season ended with a fifth place finish, the franchise was sold to Cleveland and the players were dispersed. The star of the Wolverines, Charlie Bennett, was picked up by Boston, but his career was cut short in 1894 when he fell under the wheels of a train in Kansas while on a hunting trip. He lost both legs. Two years later, the Detroit Tigers named their new field at Michigan and Trumbull Avenues after the most popular Wolverine ever. Every opening day until he passed away in 1927, Bennett threw out the ceremonial first pitch for the Tigers. In 1893, local agitation for another professional baseball team and a, and a bid was made by Detroit to rejoin the National League, but that failed. The next year, Cincinnati sports writer Ben Johnson reorganized his Western League with plans to challenge the monopoly of the National League, and Detroit signed on. The team was owned by George Vanderbeck, who said it would be the cream of the revamped league, so the Detroit creams were born. They played their games at League Park, near the bridge to Belle Isle. By 1895, they changed their name to the Tigers uh, in honor of a military unit in Detroit. And in 1896, moved to a new park at Michigan and Trumbull Avenues, the site of a former Haymarket. The Western League became the American League and in 1901 was reorganized, or excuse me, recognized as a major league loop with Detroit as a charter member. The only tangible reminder of the Wolverines and Recreation Park can be found on the grounds of the Detroit Medical Center. The road along the south of the complex is Mack Avenue with John R. to the west and Bobian to the east. Only a tiny stub of Brady Street remains and we are looking north pretty much. The historical marker is located in what was once the outfield of Detroit's premier recreational facility probably close to where that half mile sign was located in that early photograph I showed. It can be found in a parquette sandwiched between the Hart Hospital, the Women's Hospital and Children's Hospital buildings. One side of the marker tells the story of the Wolverines while the other describes the grand park for sport once located there. It was considered one of the best baseball timings in North America in its day, but its days lasted only 15 years slightly more than twice as long as Detroit's first major league team, the Wolverines. And I came back to this image because I like it so much. Um, that's Recreation Park, looking to the Northeast. We've got the cheap seats up top here and notice these signs that they put in the way to try to block the view. Uh, the, a guy named Deppert was one of the worst offenders. The, the Wolverines took him to court but the judge ruled that above a house, the air is free. It's for the owner of the house to do with as he pleases. So uh, they couldn't stop this sort of practice. And luckily, despite the rickety nature of these things, uh, nobody, um, nobody uh, was hurt or, or seriously hurt or killed. And I know this happened in Chicago and all sorts of other places, Cleveland, uh, but uh, it was the, uh, the cheap seats, at the, the original cheap seats at the ballpark that weren't really in the ballpark. And I'm allowed one plug, apparently. I was told by Pete, Mr. Mancuso, uh, this is my book about the uh, Detroit Wolverines. If you need more, uh, more details and photographs and that sort of thing, uh, it's a McFarland book. And of course, it costs what McFarland books cost, which is more than I'm comfortable with, but who am I? Just the writer. Um, well, anyway, with that, I'm going to close my presentation and um, uh, be ready to take any questions that may arise. And tell me what to, to hit here. Uh, Bob? If you'll hit escape in the upper left-hand corner of your keyboard, you'll go out of full screen and you can close your slides. Escape. I can close my there slide. You and you like can that. shut down the share screen. Uh, there are, we had several comments and, and, and questions here. Uh, there's a comment from, and I hope I'm saying this right now, but Michael Peach. Uh, the photos from Recreation Park are amazing. Where did you acquire them? Well, I became a member of the Detroit Historical Society. And I also spent time in the bowels of Detroit Public Library, which is um, an amazingly beautiful Art Deco building. And the staff there is terrific. So be between the Detroit Historical Society and the Burton Collection at the Detroit Public Library, that's where I got a number of those images. And uh, um, it's funny. Um, it's sort of funny where images crop up and um, 
I know it's the wrong century and I know it's unrelated, but just today I wrote a book about Brother Matthias, who is the uh, who was the um, the man who made Babe Ruth. He was the the, the, the Zaverian brother at St. Mary's School. And just today, a, a distant relative of Matthias sent me some uh, connected with through the Center for Canadian Baseball Research. And um, I, uh, I connected with her. She lives in Pennsylvania and she sent me the most amazing Babe Ruth photograph I've ever seen. And I, she's given me permission to use it in my PowerPoint presentations. Now, please, anybody tell me if you've ever seen this before. And I'll tell you what it is as I hold it up. According to the family, that's Brother Matthias in the back with the hat. I've never seen him in a hat before. That's Babe Ruth, and he's shaking hands with the last surviving member, a living soldier from the Civil War. I've never seen that image before. That's in their family album, and uh, I'm going to get a much better quality image of it. I wish I'd had it for my book. But the, the point of my mentioning that is you just never know where some of these great images are. And I'm going to ask Carrie, where did you get uh, your garland uh, sign and the recreation park from behind you? Um, it came out of the uh, Harwell collection at yeah. the Detroit Library, I believe. Yeah, yeah, no, same source. Yep. We have a question from uh, uh, Paul Langendorfer. Uh, if Detroit had not gotten, uh, in parentheses, stolen the players such as Sam Thompson and the Big Four, do you think that uh, baseball would have been successful in Detroit and ultimately brought them to the Tigers? Um, I think the, the problem, the bottom line problem that the Wolverines had is they were in the wrong league. They were not able to play Sunday games. Um, had they been in the uh, um, uh, American Association um, uh, instead of the National League, which banned Sunday games, uh, the working class uh, folks that would come out to the ball games in Detroit, it was uh, the ballpark wasn't in a remote location. It was it was centrally located. But the problem was people at that time in Detroit didn't have a lot of spare time and what spare time they had was on Sundays. So I think had they been able to play in the beer and whiskey league um, on Sundays, um, I think things could have been different. And for all we know, the Wolverines could still be around today, uh, but uh, not as a national league team. But I don't know if that, answer, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's my take. What the Detroit was a relatively small city, although still probably large in, in Michigan, as long before the auto industry comes in and makes it explode in the, the teens and, and 20s. But uh, they were that was always seen to be a problem in the 19th century with certain cities like Cleveland and Indianapolis. They were just small and they couldn't support a, a, a team. They would grow to be major cities hosting NFL and multiple teams now. But they I, weren't I think that there was a that. I think there was a minimum population requirement of around 50,000 or something like that at one point in the National League. The National League at one point, because London, where I'm from, London, Ontario, we had the London Tecumseys, and they were quite successful, won the inaugural season of the International Association, and were apparently invited to join the National League. But the problem was uh, the city was only about 18, 19, 20,000 population at the time and wasn't large enough. But there were places like, uh, I think, Worcester, there was uh, New Bedford, there were a number of other New England places that were quite small that they made exceptions for. Uh, ultimately, because we were so far out in left field, a bit like Detroit, you have extra transportation costs because the center of baseball was sort of in the northeast and Detroit was considered a western city, as, as is London. So the transportation costs would be quite high. My question has always just been, being from Buffalo, what if? What if they had never gotten rid of the big four? That's why I was curious. So I appreciate it. Well, yeah, and I, I, the reason I got onto the Wolverines was because I wrote about Pud Galvin and the time with yep. the, 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 the Buffalo, uh, the Buffalo, the Bisons, and uh, that was a fascinating situation. I'm, I'm looking at it from the Galvin side, and then I see that he's leaving, and all of a sudden, the big four are sort of uh, taken, and there wasn't much left in poor old Buffalo, and it was a... a Unfortunately, the fans, once they moved to Olympic Park, the fans just really weren't there and the bills were so high in Buffalo and, yeah. uh, you know, they couldn't make a go of it. And Buffalo, Buffalo was a happening town at the time. It had a lot going for it. It was a beautiful city and uh, uh, doing quite well. But baseball was a hard sell. Yeah. 
you and I talked about this at the last Fred. So thanks again. I appreciate it, Chip. It was great to, great to hear you again. Oh, thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. Uh, we've got a, a comment on the currency piece that you, you your slide on the, uh, the dollar uh, bill. Uh, the currency piece is an advertising piece given by the advertiser as an inducement to shop at its business by offering a discount. They're highly collectible 19th century items that display players is the comment from Mike Peach. That's that was my my supposition. But yeah, that sounds that makes a lot of sense. And it was a way that uh, they could show support in the community among the, the retailers and that sort of thing. So yeah, uh, thank you for that. Whoever sent that along. Well, uh, I, I'm the one who said it, and I'm Mike Pike. Excuse um, me. That's quite all right. My name is often mispronounced. Um, 19th century manufacturers um, used baseball as a means to sell their products. And the, the, uh, the currency pieces um, are one of the most um, interesting pieces of advertising. A lot of them originated with the Cubs. Oh, really? Yes. And um, or with, you know, the Chicago team. Um, but they um, they're, they're highly, highly collectible. And I'm. Uh, do you own that one? No, I, I wish I did. I wish I did. Yeah. And I I only found that out. I only discovered that after my book was out. And I don't remember where I saw it. But I said, oh, my goodness, that's that's wonderful. You know, especially yeah. Watkins mug on the thing. You know, we'd have yeah. a queen. You'd to have a president uh, on our money and he's got there's a manager of the ball team you know yeah. um, i think that's terrific i don't know if they went to the trouble of uh, do i don't know maybe you know mike but uh, did they actually use that that banknote paper or was no, it just... no they do not and i own two in my collection um they're about the size of a banknote uh, of the period yeah but what's really interesting about them and if i could do a share screen here uh, i would show you a couple of examples but What's interesting about them is that on the reverse side, it shows all the players on the team. Now, I don't know if I ever saw the reverse side of that one. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're really interesting, but I, I'm glad you showed it. It's well, a I, great I, I was, I, 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 I'd never seen anything quite like that before. And thank you for helping fill in the blanks. I sort of had a, a, a notion of what it was, but thank you very yeah. much, Mike. I appreciate that. Well, thank you for your talk. Uh, oh, thank uh, you. Chip, Bill Felber asked if there was any information about dimensions at Recreation Park. Oh, my. Um, I Looks like it could have a big center field. Yeah, it, it was fairly spacious. Um, the problem was, I think, I, I don't know the dim if specific dimensions. I don't have them. There was that drawing that had the... the the overview of it, but I don't think the, the field dimensions were on there. I think there was an issue, however, with um, with right field because the track, the, the harness racing track went along there and a, a, a poor right fielder, if he's ch chasing the ball to the fence, would probably have to cross the track. Um, but it did seem to be a rather, a, a rather significant uh, size uh, for a ballpark of the day. It looked kind of like a polo grounds kind of situation and, it was very, uh, very open. and i think that was not uncommon then yeah thank you right there's a, a comment for everyone to look at uh, tom Schieber puts a note on there about where you can find some of those images with the uh, uh detroit public libraries provided a link in the chat uh a column and you can go there and uh, see what you can find thanks for uh, doing that tom uh, our friend Dixie Tronjo asks, uh, what organizations or people are responsible for putting up the medical center sign for Recreation Park? Was that the medical center or was it a historical society? It was a historical, um, I think it's a Mich Michigan historical, state of Michigan historical plaque. Um, and you know, um, it's not easy to find. Uh, that complex is, uh, anyone that knows Detroit, the Detroit Medical Center is a complex of, oh my gosh, oh, oh there's six or eight buildings, parking. It, it's a very intimidating place, but right in this little shoebox, little between this, this little parquet between two or three of the hospital buildings, uh, it, this thing is located. And I, I think it's located roughly where that half mile sign was on the that old photograph of the park, but um, it's um, uh, it, it's 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 so I know 
15 years and then they put houses on it. Now today there's this massive complex. So I'll bet you there's a, an awful lot of people in Detroit couldn't find that park. Uh, Tom Schieber also put another uh, a link there for other baseball currency here. And we have to comment on the population. You, you mentioned that the, the uh, Constitution the National League had a population minimum and it was 75,000 okay. uh, and it, Detroit's population in 1880 uh, from Woody Eckert is that it was uh, population was 116,000 larger than three other National League clubs. Uh, question from uh, Matt Albertson. Thank you for that. There's, there's an image of Sam Thompson standing on a dock holding up a fish in his Phillies uniform. Any idea if Sam returned to Detroit for uh, <laughs> recreation? Well, a, a lot of these guys liked hunting and fishing. Um, and that place at the north end of uh, Lake St. Clair, the flats, that was where the wealthy uh, industrialists and businessmen and merchants and that sort of thing had their uh, summer homes. And it was an excellent place for hunting and fishing. Um, and uh, um, I, I suppose Sam, uh, he was, uh, I, I'm sure they all at one time or another were hunting and fishing. It was just a, the thing to do. And it was a, a, a quick getaway. It was only like 30 miles away and you're in, you're in pretty good nature. I, I've sailed through there, or just past there. And uh, it's uh, a long way away from the grimy city. Okay, very good. Uh, Don Jensen, if you make sure you're unmuted and uh, yeah. Don Jensen has uh, a couple of questions. Chip, Chip, a great, great presentation. Thank uh, you, Don. This was the series when the, uh, the Dovray Cup debuted and Helen and John, the power couple went and it was on display at first base, I think. And I believe it was in St. Louis and not Detroit. Can you say anything? I, I'm not aware of it making an appearance in Detroit. So it must be St. Louis. Yeah, it was on the home plate and, and they had a quarrel about it. Yeah. Started. No, I, I, I didn't. I did. I did a lot of research in the Detroit Free Press and the other newspapers uh, in in that area. But no, I did not come across that. That had to be St. Louis. Yeah, and, and, and just a second point, which is that um, the cup is long gone, of course, but about 15 years ago, I, I tracked down Sam Thompson's descendants, and I met them in New York, and they had one of Sam's medals and a trophy of some sort in their closet for years, and they thought that was the Dovray Cup, but it turned out not to be the case. Oh, okay. Okay, good. No, I, as I say, I'm not, I, I did, did not come across that, uh, uh, the home plate thing you're talking about in the cups and, and, yeah, and Tom, yeah. Tom just put up the, uh, the Richardson uh, medal, which I think is in Cooperstown. Right? Yeah. Oh, good. Good. Thanks Tom for all the help tonight. Hey, hey Bob, I have a question, actually a statement. Hey everyone, this is, this is Craig. Hello everyone. Um, uh, just to tease the Fred, um, I'm giving a presentation on team photos. One of my nuggets that no one has seen before is going to be an 1883 Detroit team photo. Oh, nice. So, never before seen. Never before seen. So you'll have to wait until next week to see it. <laughs> and, and, and let me let me uh, tease the Fred a little more. There's a presentation on the Wildcat stands at Recreation Park uh, as one of the talks uh, here with, with some illustrations of the uh, the flapping uh, uh, tarps that they used and the uh, close-ups of the buildings and how they built little bleachers up on the roofs. Oh yeah, it's quite the uh, Rube Goldberg contraptions they had there, but it also continued over at Michigan and Trumbull. I've seen some images uh, of the early days at Michigan and Trumbull, the exact same phenomenon and then having to put these big uh, 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 tarps up with advertising on them so that uh, the people on the rooftops couldn't enjoy the game. They were losing, they were losing revenue and uh, they tried to stop them, but they couldn't do much about it. Well, I, I, I recall reading it about uh, 1876 at the uh, National League Park in, in Louisville, a guy they had a, a six or eight foot fence and a guy would drive his wagon up to the uh, left field fence on uh, 7th Street and they sell for a dime. You could go stand in his, his, the bed of his uh, wagon and watch. So the little team built a 16 foot fence. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, uh, Chip, thank you very much. We, I appreciate the, the talk. It was very, very interesting and I covered some, some it, it was a practice in the uh, uh, 19th century that 
with that 10 day rule of the Hyde players. And it was interesting how Detroit went about it and they went well, through. Thank you. Uh, let me also note if you uh, pay attention to the, uh, the chat, Tom Sheever has given us three different links for various things from the uh, Duvray Cup medal, uh, the uh, currency and the uh, uh, Detroit uh, photos. Uh, feel free to click on that as you go forward. And Chip again, Thank you. We look forward to seeing you uh, one day soon. And Peter, if you will take over and give us a close. Chip, that was wonderful. Thank you very, very much. It was a, a real pleasure. And I know a lot of your countrymen were looking in, so you really did them proud. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I got to get back to my Blue Jays game. They were beating Yankees 3 nothing. Now it's 5 nothing. Good. Good. I'm getting back to that soon. Okay. Uh, well, Next week, uh, next month, rather, on uh, I think it's the 11th of May, uh, Bob will be doing, Bob Bailey right here will be doing a presentation on Jack Chapman, uh, a 19th century baseball life, and a very uh, fascinating individual. Uh, as I mentioned before, Alan was scheduled, and I know it came up this evening about uh, playing ball on the Sabbath, the problem uh, that Detroit faced. Uh, with their home games, of course, in the National League. Uh, not a problem in the American Association, obviously. So, uh, uh, but we do have Allen uh, postponed until our season two of the 19th Century Baseball um, Speaker Series, which will commence in September. And I just want to make mention of two things about that. Uh, one, that will be a combination uh, as you know here, every one of these presentations that you heard this year at, and, and will hear next month were previously given at the Fred. And that's why we asked these certain individuals if they would like to do We figured they would have maybe some of their materials still at hand. Uh, what we are doing next year is we're kind of splitting these sessions. There'll be about nine sessions next year, September through May. And we're splitting them. So about four of the presenters are previous, who we now know, of course, are previous uh, presenters at the front. And they are uh, Alan with uh, Never on the Sabbath, which is about uh, baseball, so, you know, in the Sabbath, <laughs> the 19th century, actually went into the 20th century too. Uh, we also have uh, Monica Nuccioni, going to do her presentation that she did at the Fred many years ago. And she's kind of refined it even. She's, she's built in a few more things about it. Uh, her presentation about Alexander Cartwright, uh, and she, what she calls the man and the myth. Uh, so that'll be very, and I know that to be an interesting topic. Uh, also, we'll have someone um, uh, who'll be doing a presentation on uh, a moment here, this is my, Oh, Mike Harper will be doing a presentation. You know, he is the chairman of the Business and Baseball Committee, and he'll be doing a presentation on uh, uh, William Holbert. Uh, and we have one other that was a previous presentation, and that'll be on Eric Frost, uh, the crazy life and crazier time of uh, death of Arthur Irwin. So <laughs> I know him to be a character in some of my own research. Uh, so those four presenters will be people who have been at the Fred in years past. However, we also put out a notice of call for abstracts for research presentations. They do May 15th. I'll put it out again this week. We're starting to get some uh, people applying with new uh, abstracts uh, to participate in our, uh, our, our other half of the uh, season two. And some of those presentations are really, really interesting. So uh, I pity the jury. Anyway. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us again. And I hope you'll be able to uh, tune in next week. It's so great to see some of these faces that, so many of these faces that I know and uh, haven't seen in a while, uh, of course, because of the pandemic and other reasons. Okay, thank you again. Thanks, Chip. <laughs>